Hi, this is Rahman Sheikh. Welcome to Fortnightly Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. I am the host and railway systems specialist working in this industry for 24 years and counting. This podcast is primarily focused on railway experts who have vast amount of experience and contributed greatly to this amazing industry. This is not a technical seminar, but focuses on feel-good stories, individual journeys, their success and failures, motivating younger generation to kickstart their career in railways and creating a sense of pride for the railway people who devoted their lives on the most environment-friendly public transportation. On this fortnight episode of Railway Transportation Systems Podcast, we are honored to welcome Pam and Paul Paul Martin, the power couple behind PM training and assessing. With 15 plus years of experience, they lead a UK-based family-owned agency specializing in Institute of Railway Signal Engineers assessments and comprehensive railway training. Pam and Paul believe in unlocking everyone's potential through growth, innovation and quality training. As owners, they manage, train and assess qualifications, ensure a top-notch standard. Their commitment to honesty, integrity and sincerity forms the core of their approach. Join us for a riveting discussion with Pam and Paul delving into the world of railway training and assessing. Get ready for insights, stories and journey through the tracks of knowledge. Welcome Pam and Paul to Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. We are thrilled to have you on board. Hello. Hi. Great to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's start with uh, Pam. Ladies first, can you share the story behind the founding of PM Training and Assessing? What inspired you to venture into uh, railway training? Well, there wasn't much inspiration behind starting PM Training and Assessing. It was more of a necessity. In 2005, we moved location when Paul got a new job with Carillion uh, and he was their IRC Assessing Agency Manager. And as part of this role, he had to ensure that the assessors were trained and qualified. The training that was currently being undertaken wasn't up to the correct standard, so he asked me to come in and sort it out. That was my area of expertise. Um, In order to get paid for this, um, I had to be a company, and this was the birth of PM Training and Assessing. I must admit, if I'd known how big we were going to get, I'd have chosen a more dynamic name. (laughs) Paul's worked in the industry the whole of his working life, starting as an apprentice when he left school. He trained as a signal engineer originally for British Rail, um, uh, and then for Network Rail, AMEC and Carillion. Um, and he's been involved with training and assessing since 1994, when he first became an IRC assessor. Up until 2018, I was the main person running the company with Paul still working full time for Carillion. Um, at that point, we were just doing the trainer and the assessor qualifications along with IRC licensing. However, with the collapse of Carillion, Paul was made redundant and he joined the business full time. And that's when we expanded into technical training and built our mobile our classrooms that we've also become known for. What a great story. I do not see any issue with the name. The name looks perfect, like a perfect couple. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? This is my first podcast where I'm uh, interviewing two people. So for us not to talk over each other, what I'll do, I'll ask you that the next question is going to be to Paul or Pam, etc. So thank you for okay. covering even the Paul story, Pam. So let's <laughs> go to Paul. With over 15 years in the industry, what key changes have you witnessed in railway training and how has PM training and assessing adapted? to these changes yeah well since I started getting involved in stuff there's been huge changes in the industry especially over the last 19 years that we've been going mainly really to do with technology Uh, when we first started assess candidates it was always face to face and there was always this massive folder of paperwork um, and documents and we had to employ someone just to scan paperwork in the early days just to make sure that it could all be sent via post we had filing cabinets full of paperwork and you can just imagine how much there was um, but now at PM Training, we're virtually paperless. All of the IRSC licensing is done using electronic documentation now and verbal assessments are carried out via video call if we need to. Um, the only time we see the candidate is for an observation and that's usually in the workplace making sure that they can do what they're doing. Um, with the trainer and assessor qualifications, we have an electronic portfolio and observations and discussions on those can be done via video call as well. This makes everything 
quicker and easier to arrange. Use of technology means that we can adapt better to what we're doing. So if a candidate has difficulty with reading or writing, we can use dictation software, um, which is you know built into most computers nowadays. We can also use technology to translate our assessment paperwork into different languages to help those whose first language isn't English. And you know it makes the scheme more open to people. One of the biggest changes in the advent of virtual reality and augmented reality and now AI, artificial intelligence. We've won awards for our virtual reality, which takes maintenance engineers into this virtual world where they're actually undertaking the aspect test. And we can actually see the consequences of what happens if they get their job wrong and then basically takes them then into a darkened room at the end if got the tests wrong um, and shows the headlines from previous crashes that have happened. But we don't take it as being complete from there. We're actually looking at how we can actually use technology now to help us. But one of the challenges, sorry, we got is with AI that you can just type in a question and it comes up with the answers for assignments for some of our learners. So what we're looking at is different ways that we can actually find out if a a learner actually has the knowledge rather than just typing it into AI itself. So using presentations, getting them to do a presentation is a different way. Well, embracing technology over 19 years, especially exploring AI to complement learning, emphasizing the importance of human skill through increased presentation assessments. Amazing adoption to change, Paul. Even in my previous podcast, we have spoken a lot about AI and I'm very glad that our industry is quick in adopting AI. And I do agree that with that paperwork when I was doing initially my IRC as well, lots of paperwork. I do agree. This is yes. a <laughs> smart solution. So so my next question again goes to Pam. So I'll be doing this alternative question to you. So Mm -hmm. Pam, uh, PM training and assessing emphasizes creating an atmosphere of growth. How do you foster a culture that encourages progression and innovation within your team and training programs? Well, developing people is the reason we exist. That relates to both our learners and our staff uh, who provide the training and assessment. Um, The world never stands still and neither should we. There's always something new to learn and ways in which we can improve. Um, We meet with all our staff regularly and review how they're doing and how they would like to develop themselves. Um, This includes things like mentoring, shadowing, online learning, as well as the the formal courses. Um, We also have team days where we all come together for the day and review what the company is doing. We often do some training then, come up with new ideas and develop how we think and view things. We also encourage our staff to come up with Um, innovative ways to develop their part of the business and this means that we are constantly changing developing and improving what we do great culture and leadership your team is lucky to have you especially (laughs) your emphasis on that continuous improvement is truly appreciated paul uh, i'll move back to you could you highlight some of the specialized irc assessments that your agency provides and makes these assessments crucial in railway sector yeah, no worries. Yeah, um, we provide assessments virtually for all of the IRC categories, which includes design, installation, testing, maintenance, and the engineering management categories, as well as telecoms. We've got a unique model as we do assessments for companies where they can register their assessors with our agency to do the assessments for their own staff. So that being the case, we still retain quality assurance and meet with all assessors at least once per year, just to make sure that they're assessing to those standards. We've had experience of delivering assessments abroad as well as in the UK. We've done design assessments in India, as well as 40 staff for the Taiwan high-speed rail over in Taiwan. We've assessors in different countries around the world. So if we have someone based there, we can also undertake the practical assessments. We're now well practiced in doing video assessments for the categories that don't involve in observation as well. Do that last sentence again. <laughs> we are now well practiced in doing video assessments for categories that don't involve observation. Ah, great. Paul, I got a question on this again. Can you explain a bit more on a unique model which enables companies to register their assessors with your agency? Yeah, basically, as long as the company's actually got a member of staff that's actually competent in that license category and is actually an assessor, then they register with us. They conduct the workplace assessment and also the competence assessment. But if it goes for our agency, then we 
retain the quality assurance. So we make sure that the quality of the assessment and the integrity of the assessment is in place to make sure that it's been done correctly. So it's it's just overseeing the assessment process, making sure that it's correct. Great insights, Paul. And now I move to Poem. As owners, you both manage, train and assess qualifications. How does your direct involvement contribute to the quality of training at PM Training and Assessing? Well, because we're both trainers and assessors ourselves, we know the pros and cons of the role. Um, So we're uniquely placed to advise our staff on how to develop and improve themselves. It also means that we can undertake the quality assurance of the qualifications as we know what to look for. It's not just about ticking boxes, but it's about making sure that our trainers and assessors are always improving and developing. Ultimately, we want to be known for having the best trainers in the business. And that means that Paul and I need to keep on top of new developments and keep improving ourselves as well. As trainers and assessors, your focus is always on improving yourself and staff. So yes. Paul, tell us yeah. about the importance of internal quality assurance, IQA. Yeah? You've been talking a lot about it in your training programs. How does it enhance the overall learning experience of your participants? Oh, yeah. Um, basically, all of our training and assessment has internal quality assurance built into it. It's really important as we are giving people these qualifications and saying that they're competent and we need to be competent confident that they have met that criteria correctly. So in an ideal world, all, if all assessors are robots and they would assess in exactly the same way. However, that's it. We're all individuals and, it, and we all have different ways of looking at things and we have good days and, you know, we do have bad days as well. But this is where the IQA really comes in to make sure that that decision that the assessor has made is the correct one. Um, it also means that the assessor can be developed in different areas to improve what they do. So the IQA can also check that all the rules have been followed correctly for the assessment and make sure that the paperwork's correct for it as well. Well, what what a vital uh, tool it is, internal quality assurance. It, it plays a key role. It helps the assessor, the SSE and the process as well. Great. Uh, Pam, question mm-hmm. to you. Honesty, yeah. integrity, sincerity are the core values of your team. How do these values translate into the day-to-day operations and interactions Actions at PM training and assessing? Uh, well, I've seen many places of work where they try and blag it. So they pretend they know what they're do- talking about, but don't really. We are honest about what we can and can't do. And we only do what we know we can do well. And we're honest and open about what we can do. We've set prices for training and assessment. So everyone knows what it's going to cost. Um, we don't try and charge larger companies more than others. And people appreciate honesty. And if we can't do something, then we let people people know. We're also honest with our team and have a culture where we support each other. We aren't out to blame each other when things go wrong. Sometimes things do go wrong, but we just need to learn from this and improve from next time. Beautiful. Very honest answer, Pam. I think people listening out there and if anyone wants their IRSC license assessed, I'm pretty sure they'll reach to you. Paul, uh, question to you again, mate. In managing and verifying IRSC licenses, what steps does your centre take to ensure that industry standards are not only met, but exceeded. Priority licenses, we make sure that our assessors and staff assess to the standards. Don't let anything substandard get through. But on the flip side, we don't expect more than what is required by the standards, um, as that would be unfair to the candidate and just making sure that what it has been set is the actual standard. So we have to assess to the standards and nothing else. However, we are constantly trying to improve our assessment service so that it works as smoothly as possible and as quickly as possible because if someone's paying for their license then they deserve to have it as quickly as possible. So moving to have only electronic records and video assessments has massively improved process and the system. It's also made it easier for our yearly audit to be done so that we can demonstrate that we've met the required standard. Great answer Paul. Especially you know you said that you don't let anything standard get through or you don't ask more than what the standard asks and you also covered the electronic records. But there is one question within the SSEs like me who wants to get the license sometimes 
assessments, the workplace assessment and competence assessment both look same, almost same, no difference. Why do we have to do that? For practical licenses, as in the installer licenses or a doing license, historically it used to be workplace assessor. So when the IRC scheme first came in, the workplace assessor used to be the candidate's line manager because the argument was who knows the candidate better than the candidate's line manager and then the competence assessment came in because they wanted someone independent sign off the assessment and say that they are competent so that was going to be the engineer in the old days that's stayed for the licenses well for all the licenses Um, and I know as you go into engineering manager licenses and some of the design licenses that it does form a very similar assessment as in a review of the paperwork and documentation and then a discussion but it hasn't changed really for the engineering manager licenses and I'm not sure if it's going to change for the initial workplace assessments. It ensures that there's that independence there. So having two assessors in agreement about a candidate's competence um, can give you that um, assurance that actually that candidate has been assessed um, to the right level and that those assessors are completely independent of each other as well. So there's no reason for them to, both of them, to, to try and you know change the system so if somebody gets a licence who shouldn't have one. A oh, beautiful answer. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Pam. I think many people ask curious got cleared for this topic Mm -hmm. and uh, my next question is to you Pam can you share Mm -hmm. a success story because you've been telling all your company's process and policies now tell Mm -hmm. us a success story or an example of how PM training and assessing has positively impacted the skills and careers of those who have trained with you Um, well one particular person comes to mind Um, he came to us a number of years ago when we were just getting into doing the technical training side of things and he was keen to get on the railway as a signal engineer no knowledge to start with he came to us for his basic training which opened the door for a contract company to take him on Um, he then gained his assistant installer IRC license and he stayed with the same company and the company then asked us to do development training for their trainees and he was part of this group and went through and did all of the the modules for our IRC approved installer course um, over a period of months and after this he achieved his IRC installer technician license. Just a few weeks ago he came on a signal and maintenance testing course with us and it's been great to see someone who was so keen to get the training required and then go on to achieve their license and he's now working all across the UK. What a great story, he's becoming an all-rounder installation yeah yeah from having no knowledge whatsoever you know he's now an installer technician and going on to do uh, maintenance testing as well so he's going to be you know one of the ones who's going to be around for years and years with lots of experience which is great yeah thanks for that and paul how do you stay updated with the latest advancements and trends in railway transportation systems and how does this knowledge influence your training methodologies i'm still well (laughs) i'm currently a member of the IRSC and also the IET and I get updates on um, any industry changes and uh, advancements in any technical information that comes up and with that I also attend some technical briefs and seminars that they put on which has been really useful and really good stuff that comes out but training myself I still go on training myself to keep up to date with my skills and knowledge and we require the same of our trainers and assessors so we don't see it as being a bit where they just stop um, once they become an assessor we expect them to keep their technical development up. We take advantage of those who have worked on new systems to share their knowledge with us as well. Um, our training courses are constantly being updated and improved, both in the way that they are delivered and the content. This ensures that we're giving the learners the most up-to-date knowledge. We also host a masterclass where engineers from the industry spend an hour every month explaining new technology or projects that they've been working on. Great answers, Paul. Uh, I, so do you want to cover anything about i heard you did something in saudi arabia as well right not saudi arabia we've done some licenses haven't we uh, we just did i think we just did a couple of guys from the uk yeah uh, in saudi right. arabia dubai we've been doing we, uh, yeah i think probably the biggest challenge was taiwan yeah uh, so, we did some licenses in taiwan and they were virtually the whole signaling section of the high speed rail yeah. which was <laughs> which was challenging <laughs> you, you've been all around the world so well with new technology we don't get to go to 
all the countries now. We do it like this, um, <laughs> and that that we're on teams, which is a slight shame, but actually, you know, allows us to do a lot more. But it would be nice to visit every country that we did some work with. Correct, I do agree. My next question is again to Paul. As leaders in the industry, what advice do you have for individuals aspiring to build a career in railway training and assessment? I think it's the important bit is to get the foundations right and getting the training right at the very beginning of your career. Training is not really a nice to have. It's the foundation stone of your career. So it's just like if you don't put the ballast on the track, when you try to run a train, everything just starts to come apart. So we need to get that initial bit right. Everyone needs to understand the basics and how the railways develop, you know, right away from the very beginning of how signalling and how the actual transport sector developed. And they can build other skills and knowledge on top of this. I speak to engineers who did an apprenticeship when I did and uh, they all say what a great grounding it was for their career. Many of them are in very senior roles now and have stood the test of time. And I think it's that bit there that, you know, if you want a career that's going to last, then you need to put those foundations in at the beginning so that you can build on that going forward. But it's really the same if you want to be a trainer or assessor. You know, these are skills in themselves and go alongside technical skills. So training doesn't come naturally to everyone um, and there are skills to to be learned as well as technical skills you know you know and you must have trained to be an assessor or a trainer and you must do qualifications that are recognized by the industry not just one company and just carry on working like that yeah i do agree with you paul completely agree with you and the other question is not just the trainees but the trainer and assessor should also be in continuous development and training you just covered that in the previous question but how do you make sure that even your trainer and assessors are getting refresher courses so do you monitor that yes we do we do reviews with all our assessors making sure that they're actually keeping up their technical knowledge as well using the model that we do most of our assessors are actually still working as engineers rather than employed as full-time trainers or assessors so we're very mindful of um, skill fade so if someone's been out of a role for a period of time you know then their skills do start to fade yeah. and so we are constantly monitoring that and actually making sure that anyone who is an assessor or trainer they're given time to practice those skills back in the workplace again and not just um, theoretically but actually practically beautiful mm. great insights Paul now a question to Pam uh, are there any upcoming projects or initiatives at PM training and assessing that you are particularly excited about and would you like to share with our listeners? Uh, well, yes, there is. At the moment, we're in the process of buying uh, a new company that will be a subsidiary of ours. And this is so that we can deliver the rail engineering apprenticeships um, in England ourselves. At the moment, some of our trainers work for another company doing this, but they're very tight rules around uh, apprenticeships and we just really believe in apprenticeships and you know the the new and particularly younger people coming on board um, and that so we're really excited about this as we're keen to promote the apprenticeships and the value that they can bring and, and that's both to the individuals and the companies and we think it's a fantastic way to bring young people into the industry and give them that foundation training that Paul just talked about. There's a huge shortage of skilled engineers, many hitting retirement age in the next few years. And we need to make sure that there's a new breed of engineers to keep the UK railways working. So yeah. Otherwise, everything's just going to grind to a halt. Not, not just UK. I think this skill shortage mm. is uh, across mm. railway, across all over the world, especially here in Australia. In my mm. couple of previous podcasts, I did cover this key issue. And most of the leaders who joined the podcast as guests like you have answered it brilliantly and have shown a number of ideas how to resolve this especially your concept of that apprentice is really really great and uh, mm. Pam and Paul congratulations on that taking over of the new company you're growing I'm so proud of you yeah we're um, it should all be going through the next couple of weeks so um, watch out on our LinkedIn profile and we'll we'll make an announcement when when the deal is all signed it's mm. a bit it's a bit like buying a house there's a lot of hoops to jump through and checking but uh, hopefully we'll get there at the end <laughs> you will congrats well done and Paul question is for you Fine 
finally what do you envision for the future of pm training and assessing and how do you see your agency contributing to the broader landscape of railway education and skill development one of our clients actually described us well as they said that um in in a feedback they described us as being the harvard of the rail training sector so once they said that that's something that's actually been shared with our team and something that we'd like to aim for for being the best um we want to provide quality training across different sectors that's basically open and accessible to everyone we believe that good training and assessment will give us a safe and efficient railway we would like to see many more countries take on competency schemes such as the IRSE um as you know just showing how valuable it is and showing what someone can do you know their competencies and stuff like that but we'd like to be involved with the decision makers about what skills and competency looks like in the rail industry and make sure that it's suitable for those working daily on the railway and train has come a long way but still has quite a long way to go really so but we're getting there yes sure we are getting there and uh, <laughs> well what a feedback from the client and uh, i think i do agree the harvard the railway training sector it's a great client and yes <laughs> i was really proud of that one yeah <laughs> and uh, to be honest from bottom of my heart uh, thank you very much pam and paul for joining this podcast and sharing your valuable uh, insights knowledge and experience is there anything you want to share through this podcast out there for for candidates who are seeking irsc licenses and how can they approach you uh, yeah they can get in touch via our website or ring our office. Um, but I think probably the biggest bit of advice uh, to anybody who's approaching thinking about doing an IRC license is gather your evidence. Um, it's the license is about proving your competence and proving what you can do. And you have to have evidence to back that up. Um, we do come across people who, um, you know, may have left a company and moved to another one and they've left all their evidence behind. And so they can't prove their competency. So have a little folder on your laptop, put your evidence in there ready for you doing your IRC license and it will make it so much easier for you because it'll all be there and all you need to do is just write the little bit to explain it and cross reference it but um yeah if you lose if we have an awful situation like where Carillion collapsed with Paul the whole computer system everything was gone and nobody could access it so we had people halfway through doing IRC licenses and their evidence all disappeared overnight so yeah collect your evidence it's your personal license it's it's about what you can do so keep it with your staff um and just keep it up to date it's harder going back over the years some of you have been doing uh, your jobs for many many years and it's hard to go back so just keep a little folder and just pop it in there as you do stuff beautiful answer thank you pam and paul thank you for sharing your insights with us that's okay thank no, you no, thank you for having us on it's been great thank you i believe everyone listening to this podcast has got something to take away from today's discussion if you like this podcast please listen follow and share this podcast within your network if you believe we should be sharing your story or someone within your network there is a railway leader who should be here sharing his or her contribution to this industry contact me on railway transportation systems at gmail.com thank you for your time today see you next fortnight until then stay safe and take care of yourself